during the night, in an unknown place, an unfortunate scene was observed in which a brutal young man literally tears another man, significantly more unlucky, to pieces with his powerful teeth and narrow wrists. By extending the perspective, one can observe a group of his comrades having a demonic appearance. The young man's account shows us that there was a time when he would never have thought of calling on these cowards his comrades and waging a bloody war on their side. However, it is now the life that he has to lead. Obviously, this boy's life has not always been so bloody and brutal, as is shown by our return to the past, where he was just an ordinary student, living his school life without any objectives. The dreams or goals for the future were absent. He merely wasted his days according to his desires. However, this was about to change. Once he has explained to his friend that he is lost by jealousy of his girlfriend, this nameless and traceless individual will suddenly see a mysterious flower falling gently on his head, causing him to fall through a magical portal that appears under his feet. Before he loses consciousness, he cries out of fear. As he wakes up slowly, a vague call from someone asking him to save the world is the first thing that comes to his mind. However, these words pass almost unnoticed as soon as he begins to observe his region. He is part of a circle of five other young people, all as dizzy as he is. Before they can find their way, a weakened former warrior, sitting on a royal throne, asks them to remain silent and presents himself as Verban Jigal, the king of the Jigal Empire. When he has watched enough anime and read manga, our black-haired anti-hero immediately identifies this as the beginning of an Ice Guy story, a change of rhythm from the usual confused main characters in these stories. King Verk claims that these six strangers have been invoked into this world as legendary heroes, charged with subduing the maniac demon king and helping the kingdom, or something similar. One could expect an Ice Guy enthusiast to be excited to be immersed in one of these stories, but our potential hero, Yuma Kurizuka, sees this as the worst scenario and wants to escape as soon as possible because of his unwavering fear of anything that seems even vaguely dangerous. The group's thorn-haired young man is not entirely opposed but demands an adequate reward if he risks his life against a real king of demons. Fortunately for him, a collaborator at his side assures him that they will be very well taken care of and that each of these new heroes will be trained in the lost arts, which are even venerated by the gods themselves, or something similar. Thanks to this, the daring boy is persuaded to check the rewards before rejecting the kingdom's request for help. On the other hand, Yuma, Although he can almost respect his courage to speak so openly before a king, secretly wants to ask this guy to calm down and stop making the conversation go ahead without consulting the other supposed heroes. However, he is aware of his great cowardice to even consider taking such a position. Instead, he follows the other members of the group while the assistant leads them to the altar where all the heroic rituals are performed. Yuma is impressed by the extraordinary beauty of this place, as well as by the splendor of Edna Hance, a woman who presents herself as the chief priestess of the Gardel Empire and who will perform the ritual that will grant them the divine blessing. Mr. Ken, Hanada chooses to be the first to put these blessings into practice, at which point he acquires the powers of the God of the Flame and the ability to manipulate these powerful fires at his own discretion. The rest of the group follow and find themselves with a rather impressive set of powers, giving Yuma the hope of being able to receive a blessing that will prevent him from suffering damage or facing danger. However, these hopes are broken like a sack of earth when he only manages to heal and revive his allies, which implies that he is just as likely to be defeated by the Devil King now as he did before. As an assistant congratulates the others for their far greater fortunes and suggests that they all share a rich feast to celebrate, Yuma is left to face the frightening battles that profile in his near future, battles for which he knows he is not adequately equipped. Unknown to others, Edna, the famous white magician, seems to feel a great aversion to herself or to her blessing, as evidenced by her penetrating gaze when he leaves the ritual room. As soon as he perceives the delicious four-course meal prepared by Gardo officials for him and his companion's heroes, Yuma feels an incredibly practical change of heart because he was afraid to be pushed into all these ice guy nonsense against his will. As soon as the assistant leaves them free, he immediately begins to fill his face, but he can barely eat a wing of chicken until one of his companion's heroes starts talking to him. It is discovered that it is the thorn-haired boy of the front, a high school student named Keita Akanishi, who does not have much consideration for the healing blessing that Yuma has previously received. Takuya Araki, a college student similar to Yuma and possessing the ice blessing, disagrees with Keita and thinks having a healer in the back guard will help balance their powerful offensive training. Katomi Erev, a high school student who seems to be Takuya's younger sister, and who has been blessed by nature, fully agrees with her brother about the importance of a healer in the back. She informs Yuma that she will count on his help when things become difficult. 
while the young healer reassures himself by realizing that his role has been assigned will at least allow him not to engage directly in a deadly fight. He begins to feel a little guilty of the relative simplicity of his work compared to that of others who will put their lives at risk. However, he quickly rejects this idea and commits to doing everything he can to adequately support them when the time comes. Unlike the assists you are damned to have when playing video games as a team, in another place of the royal castle, we notice one of the assistants visiting Edna late at night to announce that they have completed the preparations and that they will carry out a specific operation tomorrow. The eminent priestess urges them to take care of one of the specific heroes, because he is someone of precious. Despite his refusal to mention names, most indications point to Yuma as the subject of this discussion. Other indications suggest that these creatures are not good, and it will not be long before their infamous plot is revealed. The next morning, it all starts early when the same assistant as before comes to disturb Yuma's sleep by calling him to the guns. Due to the current conflict with the Devil King, the kingdom is short of medicines to treat all the wounded. He therefore requests Yuma so that she can use her magic to restore the lives of soldiers wounded by the war. Despite his surprise at this sudden situation, Yuma joyfully agrees to start earning his bread and follows the assistant into a neighboring room, where he receives a new suit to wear while working on the battlefield. When he puts on these clothes, Yuma realizes that they do not differ from the usual hospital clothing, an undeniable weirdness, but that does not seem to worry the young man excessively. However, what happens next is much more worrying. The assistant asks Yuma to sit on a chair in the center of the room. After the execution of the boy, the assistant, with a strange smile, puts a heavy hand on his shoulder and tells him that they will use his flesh and blood for unknown purposes. As the other assistants begin to hold it back, one of their colleagues prepares an abnormally large cutting instrument for the upcoming operation, while another takes out such a huge and similarly suffering syringe, the future hero is immediately overwhelmed by a fear he cannot handle, arising from a situation he cannot even begin to grasp. However, in a malicious gesture of mercy, the assistant assures Yuma that he has no fear, because having received the blessing of immortality, it is impossible for him to die, no matter how cruel and distorted treatment they inflict on him. Yuma is far from being reassured by this assurance, which tries to persuade them to slow things down and start by taking him blood or something like that. Not only do they not take full account of his request, but they do the exact opposite by cutting off his forearm without any justification or notice. Yuma immediately starts screaming for obvious reasons, but the doctor attributes his screams to a simple shock rather than a real fear. He hits Yuma in the face to calm his strangely fluctuating nerves, before making him notice that not only has he survived this catastrophic injury, but that his flesh and bones have already begun to recover in his forearm that he has just lost. While the boy is looking to understanding how this is even possible, the doctor cannot help but feel a denial pleasure in the power of the blessing of Yuma, which exceeds even the high priest's most extravagant expectations. This implies that they have the freedom to do whatever they want with the body of this innocent hero, and the first step is to move on to the drug testing phase. At the same time as Yuma's worst nightmares have come true, the prayers of these depraved doctors have been answered, and he is disoriented about what he can expect from now on. Apart from a living purgatory that unfortunately lacks all of Ice Guy's generic absurdities that he had initially envisaged. In this strange and unknown society, one can observe a woman quietly drinking a glass of what seems to be red wine, delighting in how Yuma survived his treatments. The way she looks at the boy and his intentions towards him remain as enigmatic as his identity, but it is certain that they will not remain a mystery for much longer. Fortunately, what the doctors do to Yuma after this incident with his arm is not immediately visible. Instead, the young man seems to be plunging into a fluctuating state of consciousness, recalling an easier and less frightening period of his life before suddenly being transported to another universe. He evokes jokes exchanged with his friends at university, exchanges about the lack of objective in his academic career at a dinner with his mother, etc. He recalls that he did not care very much about his future and was satisfied with dealing with any situation that might arise, living his ordinary life without ambition. However, while he is sitting on this operating chair, the body covered with his own blood, the limbs cut repeatedly and brutally for the pleasure of these cruel men and women, he becomes aware of the stupidity of this intellectual approach. He is eager to lead an existence beyond that of a helpless and unfortunate toy in the hands of these denied creatures, but he is now forced to accept this dark and grotesque reality. Fortunately, he manages to find a moment of rest from his desperate situation when he suddenly wakes up in an isolated chamber of the castle. What Yuma believed was only a terrible dream, but before he could reject everything as such, he recalls that he fainted during the real procedure, and that he was brought into this room by the doctors to rest before continuing their reproachable research. 
Since he was transported to this other world, it has become the sad routine of his life. An unceasing stream of atrocious bodily abuse that only ends when he loses consciousness and begins again shortly afterwards. The boy has completely lost the perception of time and cannot even begin to calculate the time passed since the beginning of the experiments. But it is obvious that neither his body nor his mind can endure this destructive cycle for a longer duration. As Yuma tries to escape from this pitiful existence, he perceives the noise of his aggressors slowly approaching his room. Fortunately, it was just a patrol in the area and not an invitation to take him for further tests. But it does not stop him from collapsing into tears under the weight of everything he has endured, thus crushing his heart and mind. It was at that moment that an immense magical glyph appeared above his bed, apparently in response to another desperate call for rest. The patrol staff are attracted to the light that escapes from his room, but when they arrive to observe what is happening, it seems that Yuma also managed to escape, as evidenced by the completely empty room where he was. The young man has been transported abroad and is now near a powerful and magical tree, in a room that is completely unknown to him, wondering how he got there and what fate awaits him. Before the answers to these questions are obtained, we find the other protagonists. For the fifth time in a row, Keita was completely crushed by Takuya in a game of chess. Takuya is amazed to see that failures are present in this world, while Keita is more concerned about his revenge by requesting another intervention. Katomi is surprised to find that these boys even have enough energy to play because they just came from an expedition in a dungeon. Given the late hour, she suggested that they pause their chess game in order to go to the cafeteria for a meal. The others agree to their choice and begin to go to the dining room. However, Katomi notes that several members of the castle staff have gathered. She moves with obvious panic and informs if something is wrong. As before, the assistant presents her with a false reassuring smile and tries to convince her that everything is okay. But the naive girl believes all these lies and even congratulates the staff for their dedication. We are aware that this is only a half-convincing appearance. As they head towards the castle maze in the hope of finding their escaping Kobe, the assistant warns his colleagues to keep everything about Yuma secret to the other heroes. Subsequently, we again examine this Kobe in question and find it still lying under the tree where it was transported. It seems too exhausted by all the treatments to move from there. All of a sudden, he perceives a slight noise of steps approaching his position. But before the source is revealed, we turn to the doctors who struggle to advance into the darkest and deepest corners of the castle. According to their conversation, they inform us that normally, only priests such as Edna are allowed to enter this sacred maze, but they have all been exceptionally permitted to enter it due to the emergency situation. One of them observes a strange mechanic on a wall, which is identified by one of his elders as a trap aimed at eliminating any intruders crazy enough to penetrate their secret shelter. Despite their presence of a special object that prevents the labyrinth traps from activating during their passage, Yuma obviously does not have this opportunity. Thus, he is seen crossing the corridors without paying attention to the world, being cut and chopped like a Christmas jambin in a brutal demonstration of inner security, but his body quickly recovers thanks to the power of his increasingly precious blessing of immortality. Even if the protagonist manages to rise from the ground jammed with his own fragments, he is not really grateful for what he has become thanks to this divine gift. Yuma now perceives himself as a monster with a human face, and when he discovers a relatively safe place shortly thereafter, he can only lift his eyes to the sky, feeling tears, wondering what he did to deserve such a cruel fate. The boy quickly realizes that shedding tears and turning to heaven will not bring any change to his desperate situation. Thus, he chooses to take all necessary steps to leave this unfortunate place and regain control of his life. Regrettably, the group of doctors looking for him discovers him at this very moment. Fortunately, one of these fools makes the mistake of pursuing him, forgetting, it seems, that the place is filled with dangerous traps. The leader of the group tries to slow down his stupid brother before he commits suicide. But this is exactly what happens when the fool finds himself on a board, causing a monstrous hand to cut him off in an instant. According to the leader of the group, what they have just seen is an immediate fate of death against which even the anti-trap artifact is ineffective. Information that could have been useful to the deceased about eight seconds ago. But that is no longer useful to him now. He makes the decision that they must wait for one of the chief priests to guide them for the next. But he wonders why his deceased ally set up this magic trap while Yuma was able to walk like he owned the place without ever triggering it. Evoking the character, we find the hero overwhelmingly abused a few moments later as he makes a break from his journey without a destination. He is completely lost in this confusing jungle and doesn't really know how to act but his mind is quickly diverted from his current dilemma when he hears a female voice calling him. Once his initial shock is overcome, he realizes that the sound comes from a suspicious opening in the ground. 
As he entered, he encountered the girl he had previously seen drinking wine and watching him. The young woman, with a strange appearance, but still quite charming, greets Yuma in a friendly way and presents herself under the name of Eva. Despite her desire to ask her name, it is very likely that she is already very aware of her identity. Furthermore, it could be the real way out of this ongoing nightmare. Time will tell us. Although Yuma is visibly disturbed by the sudden appearance of Eva, he manages to give her an appropriate introduction before finding that she has many tubes connected to different parts of her body. This instantly suggests to him that she may be faced with the same horrible experiences as him. When he asks her if it's true, the girl only confirms her assumption in half a word. After discovering what he has endured since his arrival in this castle, as if she had not already known, Eva invites him to relax a little in his apartments to soothe his exhausted mind and body. Before allowing it, she wondered why he wandered alone in this deadly maze. Yuma replied vaguely, claiming that he arrived there by force, highlighting that it was thanks to his blessing of immortality that he managed to survive after being fragmented by the many traps in the hallways of the dungeon. After discovering that her new friend can't die, Eva understands why he has been so cruelly experimental. She has a perfect understanding of the rarity of receiving such abilities during the ritual of blessing. However, Yuma is not at all concerned with the details of his current situation. His mind is totally focused on the idea of leaving this place using all possible methods. Since Eva seems rather healthy and seems to have suffered the same torture as him, the boy organizes and asks the girl if she would be willing to collaborate with him to escape and preserve their lives. The fact that he can't really fight to save his life is not hidden, but he will at least be able to manage all the obstacles for them thanks to his immortality. Furthermore, the young horse protagonist cannot stand the idea of letting a benevolent girl like her deteriorate in this cursed place without doing everything in his power to help her. He urges him to gather their forces in order to escape and take fresh air. It's fun and too enthusiastic to make a statement to a girl he's known for exactly 48 five seconds, and it becomes even more annoying when he keeps praise the sun for a bit too long. Fortunately, Eva doesn't laugh at him or his emotions towards him but instead focuses on his last mention of being able to handle all the traps for her. Obviously, this is a captivating perspective, but before she agrees to go with her, she feels the need to learn a little more about her own situation. According to her explanations, the reason why she is connected to all these tubes and pipes lies in the fact that the ignorant doctors of this cursed castle drain her blood for 24 hours a day, an unfortunate fate that keeps her in a state of constant anemia. In order to resolve this situation, she requests Yuma to give her a good amount of her blood claiming that this is all she needs to regain her supposedly impressive strength and help him escape. Yuma immediately agreed to these conditions, considering that the loss of blood could never cause him to die anyway. He extended his hand to Eva and offered her to take all the blood she wanted. At that moment, Eva sketches a smile bright enough to reveal her up until then invisible vampire crocs. When touched, a mouse turtle suddenly emerges from the young vampire's flesh and moves towards Yuma, Eva declares that she has the possibility of sending a part of herself at will, and shortly afterwards, the little calf sets on the hero and begins to appropriate his share of blood. The vampire girl immediately appears to benefit from all the resources needed to overcome her weakened anemic state, as evidenced by her ability to easily detach from her proverbial codes and fly to meet her new partner in person. She won't let him forget that he has agreed to give him as much blood as his little vampire heart desires, while assuring him that with the power she has given him, he will soon be able to regain his freedom which has been so cruelly stolen from him by the inhabitants of this castle. As Eva once again pulls out her crocs and begins to throw them with determination into the boy's flesh, Yuma only now realizes that she has been a vampire throughout this period because the mice were apparently not obvious enough. Despite the lack of enthusiasm that he shows after this sudden appearance, Eva, on the other hand, expresses its relief that she can finally feed on someone after being alone for so long. Get rid of your anxious thoughts. The young vampire is so grateful that she expresses her gratitude by putting a sweet kiss on her cheek, which was enough to make the little immortal red without any violence. Subsequently, she kisses her partner and chooses to make a great demonstration of her long-awaited escape from this purgatory palace, spreading her huge wings and moving through the corridors with a temporary determination. Unlike the unwise doctor who died earlier, Eva is fully aware of the importance of monitoring magic traps if she wants to avoid the maze in one piece. Having reached the position where the giant hand had been activated, she expects to have to avoid it precisely in order to escape, but she is surprised to find that it does not activate even when crossing it. Concerned enough to stop and meditate on what's going on, it simply allows the castle's search team to locate and pursue her, accusing her of using Yuma's immortal blood to escape the magic trap. 
Eva feels no fear in the face of the pitiful offensive that these clowns are planning against her, and for a reason. She easily manages to deviate the magic blast sent by the priest before explaining to him how to do by invoking a glyph above her head, which causes an explosion powerful enough to blow up this entire quadrant of the maze. In addition to killing their pursuers, this fate offers the ideal opportunity for Eva and Yuma to finally escape, but to the boy's great disarray, the vampire is not happy until it has caused a total fire in this castle. She flew in order to get an excellent view to cast a torrent of flames on the castle that so violently held her captive. This gives her the opportunity to be observed by Keita, Takuya and Katomi, Yuma's companions. Despite their perplexity about the actions of this monster girl, the group immediately finds that she is transporting their close companion. Keita, concerned about Yuma's well-being, did not fail to push his ready gun into the sky, asking Eva to let him fall. However, the vampire offers a response as receptive as one could imagine. She easily manages to escape the boy's attack and prepares a magical fate powerful enough to remove him from life. But just before starting the blast, Yuma asks him to protect his sympathetic comrade. Eva is forced to change her shot at the last minute, bringing the blast of flames closer to Kata's head rather than swallowing it completely. The impact of the blast on a building behind him is enough to astonish the boy at the ridiculous strength of this calf-winged girl but it also diverts his attention from the girl in question for a certain period of time so that she takes hold of her adorable boy and sends him to a nearby fountain. As Takuya and Katomi struggle to verify that Keita is healthy, Eva begins to reproach Yuma for having prevented her from killing Keita as she had planned and was perfectly capable of it. However, she chooses that the disorder she has generated in this castle should be enough to slow down these individuals and give him and the immortal boy enough time to get safe. Instead of continuing with violent sanctions, she asks Yuma what he thinks they should do now. The boy really wants to leave this world and return to his ordinary and unpretentious life in his original dimension. Although Eva probably doesn't understand what he's talking about, she decides to pretend to be his bodyguard until he can fulfill that desire. She simply demands that he continue to entertain her, which probably implies that he will have to let her suck him as much as his little vampire heart desires. Shortly thereafter, the duo of unlikely fugitives resumed their flight to finally leave the castle completely, without waiting for a high priestess, Edna, with a stone face and visibly concerned, to observe them from afar. In addition to that, she has already gathered a group of trusted officials including a former wizard and some of his subordinates to look for the immortal boy before the vampire girl escapes completely with him. To ensure the success of this recovery mission, Edna even gives the wizard the opportunity to use an extremely powerful tool in his arsenal a young boy with dark skin and white hair, whose eyes reveal an unprecedented power that will probably cause many problems for Yuma in the near future. If the immortal boy is not lucky, this power may even be terrible enough to bring him back into the retaliation from which he so desperately wanted to escape. A few hours later, the dawn settles and the immortal young child wakes up slowly from a well-deserved sleep on the shore of a lake, near a small waterfall. Shortly after Yuma opens his eyes, he is welcomed by the morning and captivating sight of Eva, completely naked, taking a bath in the water. She urges the young boy to approach her in the lake, but he feels that he is a little early for it and prefers to divert his eyes from this vampire exhibition. As he approaches a neighboring bush, he is welcomed by a random individual who offers him an indispensable change of clothing, which panics Yuma in the face of the unexpected presence of this person. Eva claims that she has mentally enslaved a wandering seller through her vampire mind control powers, so he doesn't worry that she will one day use the same strategy to force him to do his will. However, she quickly insists that she would never implement such strategies against the person whom she promised to be the bodyguard, so no problem of magical enslavement. After abandoning all this, the newly dressed vampire joyfully announces that there is a town nearby and decides that it will be their next date. They quickly arrive in town and immediately go to one of the local restaurants to eat, a luxury that was severely denied them during their period of captivity. The presence of Eva's vampire blood indicates that she only needs the blood she drank while Yuma was sleeping, which prompts her to eat hungry without worrying about her own nutritional health. His wife's request was gladly accepted by the immortal, but soon afterwards he wondered if she knew how to make money quickly and easily so that she could feed herself. So Eva decides to take him away from the city right after her meal to teach him how to hunt monsters, as is common in many role-playing games. She proposes that they eliminate some creatures and sell their resources for money to the Adventurer's Guild in order to ensure the presence of many monsters to be eliminated for financial gain. She escapes into the bushes of the forest and generates an infernal noise that leads to a real riot of creatures that emerge and seek to load the poor immortal without protection. 
This poor man begins to apologize like a little pig in front of the apparently invincible horde of monsters, until his vampire savior arrives at the last minute and kills every creature that has almost made him his bastard. It appears that their intention was never to attack Yuma in the first place, but rather to run away at full speed in order to escape from Eva, the real main predator of the neighborhood. Although she managed to save him from the frenzy she herself caused, Yuma now wonders how she plans to bring back the bodies of the victims of this slaughter. The answer is both surprising and extremely binding. Since he has been called into this world from a distinct dimension, Eva tells him that he has a specific set of skills and assets, such as an object box that will allow him to carry large quantities of materials, as well as an evaluation method to assess the value of the materials they obtain. Obviously, no one at the castle told Yuma about all this, which is good news for the young man, but he does not neglect to take advantage of these functions. As he explores his new unlimited inventory, he is attacked by a kind of giant slug that seems to have been very upset by the fact that the vampire has eliminated all of his friends from the surface of the planet. She tries to take her revenge by beating Yuma in front of her, as if she were a loading slug, but she is quickly sent back to her comrades when Eva diverts her breath to her new friend and eliminates the creature shortly thereafter. Yuma remembers that the glyph her vampire bodyguard just presented her is identical to the one she used to teleport him out of her cage and into the castle maze, even though he doesn't have time to think about this thought because Eva soon suggests that they stop at a friend of her to spend the night, because it's late. The immortal young child seems to find free and convenient accommodation, until they reach their destination and realize that this is a real haunted house, with floating pumpkins and everything else. Eva doesn't seem at all disturbed and expresses with joy that it's still as popular as it seems with the living dead, which partly explains why it is too scary for me, but it does nothing to soothe Yuma's obvious concerns. The owner, who feels an intense sensation of the images of generic horror films, he quickly appears outside to greet Eva and her sad companion, while informing them that there is enough room for them to spend the night. However, only five seconds inside the building lead Yuma to think about finding a comfortable place outside as many ghosts and goblins begin to bother him more and more with every step he takes in this haunted establishment. Fortunately, he quickly finds a moment of rest when he finds that their real room is astonishingly beautiful and surprisingly mindless. For the time being, it allows her to calm down, but her younger heart becomes bitter when she realizes that they only share one bed. Nevertheless, there is no problem because Eva tells him that a coffin in the corner of the room, which he apparently did not notice, is his favorite resting area. She asks if he would like them to share the bed anyway, but since it's an ice sky manga, you know perfectly well that Yuma doesn't have the muscles to accept the offer of the charming, bloodthirsty woman. It seems that Yuma is satisfied with his self-imposed position in the friendly zone, slides into his bed and prepares to take a nap. He simply remembers for a while that it's still a haunted house for a cute but scary little monster, Critter, to frighten him by suddenly appearing under his blankets. It is highly likely that his overplayed cry would have awakened the dead if the living dead had not already taken over this part of the awakening. The next day, they realize that Yuma has found an undesirable bedmate, an adorable little ball of hair, even more cute than it seems at first. Eva notices that the young child seems to have a great affection for her protector, but the immortal tells her that this thing has been following him since last night and has prevented him from sleeping in a moment. It is clear that affection is not mutual. Once again, the young vampire comes to help Yuma. This time, by offering her a so-called stone of spirit that should be enough to fight the phantom boredom. In this way, he will be able to carry the little one without having to be constantly present and to recall it at any time suitable for their trip. After finding out that the ghost, at least, doesn't seem to intend to harm her, Yuma agrees to do so before they both leave this strange hotel to go to the Adventurer's Guild or something else of normal story fantasy. When they arrive, Yuma hurries to register as a full-fledged adventurer at this traditional establishment, while expressing his confidential gratitude for the way the spirit stone has prevented them from attracting unwanted attention. More pronouncedly, it is Eva's appeal that attracts everyone's attention, including their fat grandmothers. However, given that I doubt that the vampire has a stone of seduction hidden somewhere, it would seem that it is the break of the day. The friendly receptionist quickly completed Yuma's registration and handed him a card that he could use as an identifier from now on. However, before he and Eva can leave now that they've finished this race, a bearded Casanova approaches the young vampire, passes an arm around her shoulder and tries to incite her to abandon the immortal and take a ride on her pony baloney or do something else annoying. The clown's attempt to steal his non-girlfriend immediately causes problems for Yuma, but there is really no reason to worry. Eva firmly discards the guy and calmly explains that she is of the dedicated type, which means that she has already decided which man she is going to make love from now on, and it's definitely not him. 
the immortal and the dragger remain silent, but the young vampire does not wait much longer on this little incident before declaring her intention to raid into the dungeons. When they enter the first maze filled with creatures, Yuma is already caught by the total lack of sleep of the night before. He intends to satisfy Eva's desire to participate in a raid, but first he wants to assess her skills and statistics with her ability to evaluate before rushing to lose them. It turns out that the race will not be required for them to spot the danger in these surroundings, as a bunch of dreadful monsters suddenly appears and jump on the duo without reason or provocation. Of course, the extremely powerful young vampire doesn't even sweat a fraction by eliminating them at once. But even if that's not a challenge for her, she is always delighted to finally be attacked by monsters instead of having to start the fight once in her life. After checking her statistics page, Yuma tells her that she has never been the victim of beast attacks before because there was a parameter that disabled her ability to attract the monster aggro, something he decided to change. The powers of invoked children such as Yuma seem to impress Eva, but she is much more captivated by the atmosphere surrounding the dungeon and goes exploring. The monster stays with the immortal boy in order to collect the remains of their bodies for sale to the Guild of Adventurers. Despite her initial disturbance when her ghost shadow frees up from the spirit stone with her consent, her dissatisfaction turns into appreciation when the adorable little one begins to assist her in collecting the monster's drops. Only two hours have passed, and this thing is already more convenient than the usual pet. Once he and the ghost have finished collecting the bribes of war, Yuma finds a moment to realize the unexpected turn his life has experienced. He still finds it difficult to accept that everything that has happened to him since his arrival in this world has not been an unceasing and frightening dream. Despite the difficult start of things, he thinks there are fates far more difficult than spending time with his devoted bodyguard and Casper, the kind ghost, because Yuma had the courage to feel good in his life for more than five uninterrupted seconds. The universe sanctions Yuma by imposing on him one of his most terrible destinies. Suddenly, he finds himself wrapped in a bunch of bandages and taken away by an unknown individual. Soon after, Eva retrieves the bodies of a few more monsters, but she is unable to grasp what happened with her precious and sweet bowl of blood. Before she can solve this riddle, she is taken by surprise by a terrestrial giant, apparently led by a much smaller wicked magician. Thanks to her vampire reactions, she manages to precisely avoid the assault, and then she sends a severe and threatening warning. These newcomers have only one chance to tell her what they did to her precious Yuma before she cuts them into bloody pieces. Another magician, this time an older man who leads the other fighters, shows no fear, merely praising the pure-blooded vampire's skills before launching a much faster fighter to challenge her. Unlike the previous massive giant, this little peon is so fast that Eva really has to make an effort to avoid its attacks. However, she makes a mistake when she chooses to examine the marks on the arm of this fast shot during the battle, which leads her to make a flank large enough for them to hit her in the belly with a magical and powerful elbow. The vampire girl suffers two injuries. Not only is she visibly wounded by the violent blow, but she is also psychologically disturbed by the fact that this dead-dead individual can still use sacred magic. As she tries to free herself, it is realized that Yuma was still sitting on the top of the trees, always attached to all these bandages. The immortal boy is not fully aware of what is happening, but when the grotesque wizard begins to manifest an extremely uncomfortable attraction to the sight of a pure-blooded vampire so totally limited, it is clear to him that Eva is in mortal danger. Yuma tries to free himself and come to his aid. Surprisingly, you just have to do a few moves to completely get rid of the bonds and collapse to the ground underneath. The ease with which he escaped makes him even more perplexed, but he has no time to think about it. Currently, he uses a magical glyph and seeks to exploit his healing blessing to free Eva from the bonds of destiny. By resorting to divine grace, he manages to push it aside and invoke many glyphs to avoid a fatal attack by the giant. They planned a short rest period that Yuma uses to check that Eva is doing well. Despite her bodyguard's claims that she is mostly well, her magic ability has been temporarily altered by her bonds and is too unstable for her to be able to use it for the time being. It may seem that this unlikely duo is doomed to virtual death, but Yuma is determined to fight to the end. Fortunately, he has a strategy that could be exactly what they need to win the day. Eva seems perplexed by the idea that Yuma has an idea. But she is even more curious whether the magic glyphs that protected them from the giant's fist are the fruit of her imagination. The boy is eager to prove that his assumptions are correct. Not only does he have the ability to use pseudo-teleportation artifacts, but his defensive skills even enable him to create protective obstacles. This surprised both his bodyguard and the wizard who was convinced he had captured them. However, the old man is unaware of the details of what just happened. Since Yuma cannot die, he plans to mobilize all his forces to capture the boy and bring him back to the castle. 
the giant and the powerful rush to Eva and Yuma to put an end to this masquerade. But the vampire girl jumps several floors into the air, making their attacks completely useless. Subsequently, she tries to escape by flying. But the magician who previously struck her sets up a protective barrier that stops her escape and cancels all of her physical attacks in an attempt to destroy her. It appears that they were prepared for all possible situations, which becomes even clearer when the wizard quickly offers a bottle of strange liquid that, once consumed, allows him to launch a sacred magic much more dreadful than the one previously revealed. However, it is not scary enough as Yuma has no concern to build a small barrier that stops the magic explosion. He gradually but surely adapts to using his blessing in battle and informs Eva that he may be able to conjure a teleportation fate powerful enough to overcome the barrier and save them, but only if she stops flying so fast to give her an opportunity to concentrate. Once the vampire girl has burst out of laughter at the strangeness of her little protector, she highlights that Yuma uses an ancient type of magic that, unlike today's arcanic arts, relies exclusively on intuition and emotion to be mastered, rather than on training and repeated use. This means that he just has to visualize loud enough this incredible teleportation fate he's talking about, and magic will conform to his will without a doubt. Yuma tries to accomplish the same thing, but the rapid diminishes the distance between them and prepares to temporarily put an end to his suffering before he can escape. The speed of time slowed down almost at a standstill, while the mind of the immortal was overwhelmed by the fear of not being hurt again by this rapid abyss, even though he fails to escape the barrier as originally planned. This deep desire manifests itself exactly as Eva had mentioned it. He obeyed his will by installing a teleportation portal on the arm of the speedboat that emerged just above his head, which unintentionally pushes the little speedboy to cast his own fate of sacred magic on himself. Before collapsing to the ground in a seemingly destroyed pile, he screams of pain before rising up like a zombie who just doesn't know when or how to stay on the ground. Eva is so impressed by the infallible resilience of this magic peon that she establishes the links and understands how the evil wizard managed to train such a dedicated combat servant. The creator must accomplish one of the cardinal taboos of the magic world to create a dead living being who is both devoted to the sacred magic arts and strangely resistant to the same magic. Eva tells the old man of this serious accusation, and the wretched wretch doesn't even try to deny it. In fact, he is so hasty to explain every mistake he has made to get such a powerful panty that he chooses to give a little history lesson to Yuma, who is naturally ignorant of how magic works in this world. This will allow him to stay all on the same wavelength here, at the beginning of everything in this world. The magic of nature was inaccessible to humans. The arcanic art skills they were able to acquire were acquired by acquiring the powers of divine creatures or ancient spirits, and not by invoking something and even here, it was inferior to the real thing. In order to control the power of its magical counterparts, the church worked tirelessly to conceive a unique individual, both human in appearance and supernatural in its capacity for the arcane. Years of experimentation have resulted in the creation of the little speedster you see here, an ideal example that combines the best of humanity and magical minds, with the added advantage of not possessing one's own will and being entirely subject to its creators. In appearance, this may seem rather embarrassing, but the reality behind the origin of this goose becomes even more serious when the old man reveals that the church had to sacrifice countless souls of innocent children to give this creation its magical powers. It is clear that Yuma's heart and mind are deeply upset to discover how cruel these so-called people in the church are. He seeks to accuse the old man of the horrible acts he has committed against defenseless children. But the man is so deprived of any morality that, since the children were all orphans, he does not regard his actions as ill treatment, but rather as giving them finally a certain reason. Yuma needed to just hear that from that living and laughing bag of dirt to be convinced that no matter how much his appearance may resemble that of a human being, he is nothing more than a monster of the greatest number. Eva therefore decides to address the monster's lack of character, stating clearly that pushing to create a chimera is not worthy of pride. However, of course, the old man does not even try to listen to his logic or reason, and simply criticizes his way of thinking as being too archaic to appreciate what it is, a considerable advance for all mankind. This word battle ends here. Yuma chooses to briefly exchange with his bodyguard, while the old man recommends them to return to the battle so that this confrontation finally reaches its natural conclusion. Despite the uncertainty about what the immortal boy had to say to the vampire girl, it is possible to estimate that he has yet to elaborate a brilliant plan to evacuate them alive from there, as the chimera soon begins and triggers a monstrous electrical search that threatens to decimate them on the spot. However, instead of showing evasive defense as they have done so far, Yuma's plan appears to ask them to remain immobile while they are completely submerged by the magic explosion. 
their silhouettes are barely visible in the wave of arcanic energy. But when the breath finally goes out, no trace of the vampire or immortal is left where they were before. Fortunately, this is not explained at all by their total erasure from the surface of the planet, but rather by their ability to avoid any damage through careful teleportation that sees them appear just above the chimera. Rather than seize this opportunity to inflict a fatal blow on the poor puppet, Eva unveils the first step in Yuma's plan by launching her vampire mind control fate. Because of the immense power of the chimera, it will only be possible for him to maintain his grip on him for a few seconds. Fortunately, this is the time it takes for Yuma to activate the second and final step of his secret plan, which involves activating a lot called Force Block that seems to weaken the brain of the Chimera to the point that it is completely incapable. Very convenient, it also has the advantage of giving Yuma the ability to manipulate the same destructive spells that the Speedster used previously, which he does not hesitate to use on the Wizard and other magic pedestrians. Before the old warrior can even utter a full sentence, he and his puppies remain confronted with the enormous power of the Chimera's power, while a huge torrent of electric energy emerges from the ground and rises to a considerable height above the summit of the forest. After the dust falls, the burning body of the wizard remains inactive, testifying to the emerging victory of Yuma and Eva in this prolonged power struggle. A pleasant moment that is almost ruined when the immortal young man feels the desire to move away from a cliché replica of heroic action that he is not even elegant enough to succeed. Shortly thereafter, the immortal boy and the vampire girl leave the dungeon site to return home. Eva regrets the difficulty of managing such a complex group during their first visit to the local dungeons, but she reassures herself that they have nevertheless managed to obtain a rather rare prey. It obviously alludes to the Chimero boy they chose to take with them, who sleeps quietly and looks much nicer than before, now that he doesn't try to blow them up from here at Kingdom Come with sacred magic. The idea of bringing this young man back seemed to be Yuma's, and it was such a captivating idea that Eva was unwilling to refuse the request of her protector. Once the Chimera wakes up, she wondered what the immortal was planning to do. Unfortunately, she will have to wait for Yuma to wake up to get her answer, as the boy suddenly collapses, falling to the ground and becoming completely inert. Although Yuma may be immortal, it should not be forgotten that he is far from invincible. The next morning, Yuma finally arrives, and they observe him wake up from his deep sleep with Casper, the kind ghost who is faithfully by his side. He has no idea where or how to get there but his confusion is quickly dissipated when Eva enters the room with a hot liquid and a towel to take care of her protector in war. The boy begins to recover his memory, and he recognizes this place as the same haunted house where they spent the previous night. Although this reflection is interrupted when the vampire girl plunges the towel into the bowl before violently throwing it on Yuma's head. Although the boy does not feel much affection for taking a fabric soaked with an unknown substance on the skull, he begins to appreciate it once he realizes the delicious flavor that it releases. According to Eva, it is a special preparation prepared by the owner of the house for him after he has fainted of exhaustion after their fight against the wizard, the chimera, and these two other goons. She then begins to explain how, although physical fatigue can easily be cured by magic, a massage is the best way to treat mental exhaustion, which seems to be a sufficient reason for her to start removing Yuma's clothes without her consent. The cherry boy reacts exactly as expected, recovering quickly and assuring him that his massage services will not be needed no matter what happy result they could have offered him. Although she clearly expresses her disappointment that she is denied direct contact with her precious bucket of blood, Eva respects her wishes and simply chooses to go to town to shop for them both. Yuma feels they could still be in danger after everything that happened the other day and warns her to walk anyway, just so that the incredibly scary but surprisingly kind master doesn't show up from nowhere. She assures him that since the adventurer's guild takes every undesirable problem in the corner very seriously, there is no reason to worry as long as they remain within the limits of the city. In this situation, Eva asks the increasingly charming little ghost to watch Yuma while he recovers, before taking a break to go shopping. It was only when his bodyguard left that Yuma noticed that the young chimera of the previous day still slept deeply in the bed next to him. Even though their decision to take him with them was made recently, it is now clear to the immortal boy that he will be ruthlessly pursued by church members, no matter where he goes. He thus begins to wonder whether it is appropriate to engage this young child and even Eva in this risky affair. The owner of the house, insightful enough to understand his inner torment, asks Yuma what is concerned, to whom the boy entrusts this full crisis on the fact that Eva and the others will only make sure that they will live their lives on the run. The realization that his devoted bodyguard is once again trapped and condemned to an eternity to suffer the blood siphoned by these fraudulent doctors scares him to the point that he calls this whole journey into question. 
However, the old master tries to persuade him that he should not be concerned about such things, even if he has only one argument to provide about it. Eva has an extremely cheerful disposition. Just at that moment, we cross the streets of the city and see this incredibly cheerful vampire moving as if she had control of the place. A kind stand owner acknowledges her beauty and invites her to go through her stand to get a discount, an offer that seems too interesting for the benevolent blood-sucking vampire lady to refuse. Before examining her products, she buys a large quantity at a competitive price and leaves with a warm farewell and a radiant smile. Shortly after saying goodbye to the owner of the stand, his attention is attracted by an agitation nearby. The day before, the enticing adventurer douchebag who tried to seduce her makes an urgent appeal for all the adventurers of the city to gather at the guild as soon as possible to face a real army of sinister wolves spotted in the premises. In order to make things even more difficult, while sinister wolves are usually much bigger than your average wild dog, the head of the mob is an extremely imposing individual who looks right out of Princess Mononoke. Even though these humans are as frightened by the imminent threat of sinister wolves, Eva is actually enthusiastic about the idea of fighting with hundreds of wild beasts and begins to leave the city to confront them directly. The observation of the dragger douchebag and warns her to respect the limits of the city for her own safety. However, even if this seductive vampire appreciates her kind care, it is both undesirable and unjustified. It generates a violent storm, disturbing men enough that they can spread its wings without noticing it and disappear from the scene. Mr. Flirty Douchebag, who does not seem to be as scared as we initially thought, is about to pursue him out of fear for his life, but is quickly deterred by his comrades, aware that they do not have enough people to follow her. He makes every effort to gather the adventurers in the hope of overcoming the frightening wolves and preserving Eve's eternal life, while not knowing that it is these terrifying wolves, and not the charming vampire, that are in danger. Then our vision goes to the current location of the army of sinister wolves, where we observe the chief observing a young couple. It seems that this duo is aware that they cannot escape this horde of dogs and that they are so frightened that they seem to almost accept the brutal death that awaits them. The first attack of one of the wolves is diverted by man, but this initiative costs him his sword, which is thrown into the air, leaving him completely unprotected. Surprisingly, as soon as the sword fades, it returns to its origin, destroying almost one of the wolves in two. The boy, cleverly, does not ask himself questions about what is going on and seizes this opportunity to take his wife and get out as quickly as possible, thereby guaranteeing their future existence. The very thin nose noticed the indisputable scent of a little rat, any other than Eva, the bodyguard. Despite his boldness to come here on his own, the wolf quickly tells him that he has become the master of this forest after having lived for 400 years and that he does not plan to be defeated by a simple sucker of blood. Near human civilization will soon be invaded by sinister wolves who will simply decimate each individual to expand their geographical influence. Eva stands on their way, which simply means she will be the first to fall. One of his subordinates charges the rather small vampire in order to devour her, but he not only fails, but the whole vampire is literally cut into pieces by the vampire's sharp wrists, thus ending his life in an almost absurd way. Eva then accuses the 400-year-old creature of being too young to attack someone like her explaining to her that being attached to the neighboring town and having a dear comrade resting there, her little conquest will have to be suspended for an indefinite period. However, when she expresses herself, Eva loses her human personality and transforms herself into a frightening wolf, barely different from the chief she boldly threatens. On falling on a thousand-year-old pure blood, the great wicked wolf begins to tremble in his non-existent boots, appearing to be the only creature possessing vampire characteristics while being able to transform into a fierce dog. Despite his proud appearance a few minutes ago, the leader is not stupid enough to seek a battle he cannot win, immediately deciding to escape with the rest of his mob. It is difficult to call him a coward, even though he is well loved. Eva returns to town shortly afterwards in order to find Mr. Flirty, who is still gathering troops against the threat of the furious wolves. She greets them in a funny and innocently gentle way, but all she receives for her problems is the adventurer who offers her a soap to soothe her concern about her safety. He realizes that she came from the direction where the wolves were spotted and wondered what she was doing. However, the young vampire simply explains to them that all the bad guys were just passing by and congratulates the adventurers for their excellent work, even though they have actually done nothing. Then she leaves the stage without saying another word, but not before leaving some kind of plant on the armor of the old douchebag. Returning to the haunted house, Yuma and the owner of the place constantly exchange, while the first passes his hands into the chimera boy's hair. It is interesting to know whether the poor child will remain unconscious forever, to which the old man responds by saying that, now that his creator is dead, it is possible that he will never wake up, 
and that his body will begin to break down due to the lack of food. It is obvious that this does not please the immortal young man with a good heart at all. So the old man tries to teach him a wisdom about how excessive emotions sometimes incite individuals to be selfish in their searches. Hoping that these words will resonate with Yuma and guide him in the decisions he will soon have to make about the Chimera Boy. Once this little knowledge bomb is released, he apologizes to take over the rest of his field. After some time, the old man returns to the room to announce to Yuma that dinner will soon be ready. However, a flower known as White Feather quickly attracts his attention by flying in front of his face as it enters the room. He calls it an extremely beneficial plant for relieving fatigue and depression. But as far as floriography is concerned, it embodies someone who prays for the happiness of others. However, by fixing the bed, it seems that no prayer is required. The magnificent appearance of Eva, Yuma, the Chimera Boy and Casper, all together in a lovely little team, is attractive enough to convince even the most disappointed soul that, no matter what trials they have all been through in the past and the problems that appear on the horizon, they will find a way to build their own happiness, together, side by side. Later, we explore the dark, wet depths of an unknown forest and discover a trio of equally unfamiliar adventurers in great difficulty as they seek to escape an army of dead dead who are chasing them. Despite their considerable speed compared to any zombie apocalypse story, the leader of the herring-haired group believes that at the end of the day, they are only mindless creatures. He separates some of them in the hope of getting free with his comrades, but this almost has the opposite effect and surrounds them even more. The trio finds themselves faced with a terrifying vision of a skull-like figure, seemingly important to the army of the living dead. The situation is becoming even more desperate. He is accompanied by an additional army of flesh-eating people and he simply throws an empty, threatening gaze before asking his surroundings to recruit three new members for his mindless battalion. It seems that a group of horns were watching this sinister scene from the tops of the trees. Although many horns began to fly disorderly once the battle reached its peak, it seems that a specific bird felt the need to visit a certain haunted house. The rest of the night is devoted to flying to the mansion in question, where the old master welcomes both the bird and the little parchment attached to one of his legs. After reading the message on the parchment, the old man has not much to say, but you don't have to be the brightest to grasp that it was probably just bad news. Within the haunted house, Yuma is having fun with her charming ghost when Eva calls her to explain how she transformed the unconscious Chimera boy into her own doll. Until the boy's arm is abruptly detached from his body, the vampire girl is shocked and Yuma loses her calm, flees against her bodyguard for what she could have done to cause this. Despite the regeneration process of the arm, the fact that the connective cells are already dead, and that its sleeping body is unable to support healing indicates that it will simply continue to detach as soon as it pushes back each time. This duo with extravagant ideas devises an equally extravaging plan to keep the Chimera in one piece, a situation in which the old master of the house is unlucky to participate when he comes to visit them. After protecting the boy's body with a set of bandages, the group goes to the terrace to enjoy a delicious tea moment, during which the old master's name is finally revealed as Davis. However, it is obvious that the real motivation of this small meeting is to allow Davis to reveal the content of this bad auger message that he had previously received from the horn. Eva quickly becomes comfortable and encourages her to approach the main topic. As planned, the letter referred to the considerable number of dead and alive soldiers found in the eastern region, with the main challenge being a lich, the dreadful skeletal creature that we have observed fighting the second army against this trio of condemned adventurers. Yuma remembers that the liches actually represent the kings of the dead, a subject that one generally does not want to laugh at, but it is precisely the kind of enemy that the impatient vampire is prepared to face. She learns about the strength of this terrible threat, which Davis confirms to be extremely significant, due to the number of people who died and lived under his control, as well as the thickness and spread of the deadly miasma he described as infesting the forest. Eva is comforted by the news, because she thinks that the power of this lich is exactly what they will need to save the Chimera boy. The use of high-level authority magic by the lich to lead the army of dead-lived sub-figures is similar to the one that can be used to give someone the power of the Chimera, which will actually wake him from his sleep. Yuma quickly wondered if using the magic of the lich in this way could make lich the new Chimera master, but Eva, still confident, assured her protector that she would never let this happen. Since authority spells can be transferred from one magic user to another, this will simply persuade or force the skeletal monster to collaborate with them and take control of his new favorite doll at one arm. Problem solved. Later in the day, Eva, Yuma and Casper have already taken the necessary steps to get to the East Mountain and face the Lich and its carnivorous gang. However, before leaving the haunted house, Davis handed them a letter that he wanted them to show to the person who transmitted the message of the horn. 
In addition, it prevents them from poisonous insects that multiply in the eastern region. Yumo, constantly angry, is frightened by this information. But Eva does not understand why he feels anxiety, while they are still going to fly east. Shortly thereafter, they are observed flying over the sky with extraordinary ease, having already reached the eastern region at an incredible speed. As expected, one can immediately feel the darkness of the lich miasma, even from here, and the consequences of this sinister energy scared Casper to the point that he dived without hesitation to the ground. At least that's what it seemed. In fact, he recently noticed a woman standing still in a small clearinghouse and went down to check if she was healthy. Eva and Yuma turn to the woman, who contacts her in case she is the informant mentioned by Davis. However, when she turns to them, she looks more like Sadako than someone with whom Yuma would expect the old master to behave. However, what is even more fun is that this scary creature, which Eva identifies as a banshee, is actually the informant to whom they are supposed to pass on the correspondence. Once Eva gives her Davis's message, she joyfully confirms the reception, which does not bring any help to poor immortal and frightened Yuma, already astonished and lying on the ground. Following the trio's tragic affair, neighboring adventurer establishments considered the situation so desperate that they refused to send teams to deal with it. Another example of the gravity of the situation is that even many living dead in the region, including Sadako, perceive this whole matter as really misunderstood, because despite the increasing power they receive from the growing thickness of the miasma, any level of power that a living dead creature can acquire is accompanied by a double dose of suffering that they have to endure at each stage. The low-level living dead are no longer under the domination of the lich and escape all this masquerade to escape this suffering. Since Sadako, a surprising and gentle woman, hates to see her fellowmen suffer this suffering, she bends her head and begs Eva and the others to save the living dead from themselves in every possible way. The only concern lies in Eva's total ignorance of the living dead and her only interest is to face the lich to save the chimera boy. However, it is simply necessary for Yuma, who is much more empathic, to shoot on his arm as if to ask Sadako for their help, so that the vampire woman immediately changes her mind and undertakes to do everything in her power to save her. After receiving their assistance, Sadako tells his new comrades that the miasma is so intense that they will not be able to see anything if they fly above which will force them to move on foot from that point on. She observes their departure into the forest, but Yuma can't stay more than a few minutes before her body begins to experience severe allergic reactions to the toxic fog, even making walking difficult. Although Eva is well aware that he is never in danger of losing his life, she is concerned enough about his well-being to transform into a normal-sized version of his wolf and encourages him to move on his back. Once they have taken a moment to taste the extreme softness of Eva's recently acquired fur, the duo once again focuses on the task to accomplish and prepares for their inevitable confrontation with a deity of the living dead. Unfortunately, they seem far less prepared than one might expect, because soon it is Eva's turn to lose her calm due to the miasma that irritates her hypersensitive wolf nose. Rather than persevere in her search in vain, she proposes that Casper be ready to help and accompany them to the nest of the lich. It seems that, since ghosts are barely present in the first place, they are completely insensitive to miasma and should not have any difficulty exploiting their full potential. The cute little ghost joyfully responds to his request, and shortly thereafter, they meet the first group of live dead that they've seen since their arrival in the forest. However, the fried fish are much bigger than those of these low-level meat consumers, so Eva cleverly escapes and makes a way through the group, continuing her quest for the lich. Shortly thereafter, they discover exactly the evil creature they were looking for, busy making another set of grotesque ghouls to strengthen his army. Although he does not look at these newcomers, the lich can immediately feel that he is faced with a bloodsucker with dreadful crocs. He also has the ability to communicate, so he asks them to leave, because he has neither the time nor the desire to play with them. Eva, who has recently regained her human appearance, has no concern to go directly to the part where they begin to throw spells. At first, she throws a classic magic blast directly on the lich. But despite the impressive explosion, the dust dissipates to reveal that he has perfectly avoided any damage by protecting himself in a shell from his dead-lived minions. After carefully examining Eva, the Lich realizes that she is a pure blood and not just a second-class vampire, which seems to convince him that he suddenly has enough time to take care of her. However, he is mistaken to mention her as the insatiable pure blood, an old title of Eva that she does not really appreciate today and makes another mistake by stating that he will not waste his time talking to someone who has chosen the way of monsters like her. He is prepared to murder her rather than associate with her. This generates a silent but undeniable anger in the vampire woman, who employs an unprecedented method, using the shadow of her wings to open what seems to be a tangible portal to hell, from where several creatures resembling biped and demonic dogs appear. 
these so-called blood servants are subjected to her, and she does not fail to send them forward to take care of this unnecessarily rude skeletal king. However, it is important to remember that Eva is not the only one here with servants listening to her, as demonstrated by the reappearance of a stream of dead living figures around the lich and their attempt to stop the bloody servants in their attack on the dark divinity. After satisfying her dogs of hell as adequate entertainment, Eva then decides to launch a lot that sees an immense sphere of fire magic crashing over the army of the living dead and her own blood servants, like a spiritual fire. A massive explosion occurs, similar to that of Dragon Ball Z, but similar to many attacks in this series, it turns out to be totally ineffective against its target once the dust is dissipated. This time, the Lich was not saved by a crowd of living dead, but rather by an incredibly impressive living dead dragon that he managed to invoke just before his last attack sounded. The giant creature is impressive enough for even Eva to congratulate her on her invocation skills, even though her kind words are not convincing enough to convince this newly arrived creature to offer her a gift. The young woman begins to direct a jet of dark energy into her mouth in order to throw it on her master's adversaries. But the young immortal healer successfully establishes a defensive barrier just before the breath is released, completely cancelling its effects and preserving its bodyguard from evil, to her great surprise. Whatever the decrease in her gross offensive power over Eva, Yuma has no intention of simply relying on her to undertake every engagement with an enemy. If anything can be done to help him, you can be sure he will. Soon, an intense battle will unfold between Yuma, his bodyguard, the Lich and his dragon. The major players rise into the air and begin to flatter each other in order to take the offensive advantage, while their supporters use numerous spells to support them from the ground. Lich quickly realizes that the immortal boy uses ancient magic, which he knows from personal experience is powerful enough to force him to take care of Yuma before attacking Eva. The vampire quickly goes to his side and is not prepared to let him fall without doing everything she can to preserve him. However, neither she nor the boy seem to realize that the lich has discreetly dug a hole in the ground, from which a new threat will emerge soon. When the king of the living dead refuses to examine the advances of this other invocation, Eva seizes the opportunity to charge him and try to put an end to his endless misery. However, her shots failed to reach their target, which eventually prompted her to take a breath from the bearing dragon, or at least that would have been the case if Yuma had not once again managed to make a feat with a protective barrier. Strangely, and with a certain charm of Eve, the Lich then chooses to jump on the back of his dead living dragon and escape without even saying goodbye to his opponents. Without thinking about it, the vampire woman embarks on her pursuit, leaving Yuma without wings and without a dragon, crossing the forest filled with miasms, in the hope of offering her additional support. The first attempts he makes to find her go as well as you could imagine, but fortunately, he still has Casper, the kind ghost, to guide him to their destination and minimize accidents with the living dead on the way. Eventually, they find themselves faced with an immense gap in the ground, which seems to lead directly to Hades' own domain. Despite the temptation to dive into this room and discover the indescribable horrors it contains, Yuma does not let this intrusive thought take over and simply chooses to sit next to it and wait for something to knock on her door. This moment occurs earlier than the boy would ever have anticipated, as he suddenly feels a frightening shivering passing through him, while friction spreads throughout his skin. As he turns around, he discovers an immense, but strangely childish, dead living monstrousness spying on him from the top of the forest, a spectacle that arouses such fear in Yuma's heart that he is barely able to react in a word. His intelligence is at least slightly better, and he accurately describes this titan as a giant zombie baby. Eva quickly appears from the surrounding trees, expressing her anger for not having succeeded in capturing the lich, whom she kindly nicknamed Bone Bag. She barely notices the presence of Yuma and takes the time to wonder why he is so pale as a laundry, as if being abandoned in a dead forest and finding face to face with a colossal baby zombie monstrosity are not obvious reasons for his pale. After a short analysis of this dead baby, Eva believes that it is the real source of the evil that plagues this whole region. Furthermore, she is convinced that the call of this creature, rather than the many armies of overloaded dead lived warriors, is the real reason why the Lich arrived in this forest first. According to her, the Lich could easily decimate and command several cities with the power of this monstrous creature, making it a valuable ally for a dead living deity seeking to destroy mankind's day. Fortunately, it is not necessary to listen carefully to the vampire girl, because the divinity in question will soon return to the stage. After Yuma begins to question him about the reason for the creation of such horror, the Lich reveals that Eva's analysis of the whole situation was incorrect at all levels. Not only did he not participate in the creation of this dead and living child, but contrary to what we've all assumed so far, he's actually there to confirm the damn thing. 
As soon as these words leave the lich's non-existent lips, he activates the numerous cranial totems he has strategically arranged around this whole force, thus creating a magical glyph that transforms the giant child into a child of a much more ordinary size. The resulting magic seems to completely purify the vital force that keeps this pitiful creature together. This powerful arcanic art eventually leads the minds of the children, of whom the living dead child was composed, to regain their natural forms and to scatter around the skeleton before disappearing, seem to finally find peace thanks to the efforts of the allegedly malicious skeleton. Yuma hesitates to fully describe everything he has just seen, but he is convinced that the emotions he has felt in him are a strange mixture of happiness and sadness. After begging for the inner peace of the minds of these children, the lich turns his back on his former opponents and begins to leave this place once again, without saying a word of goodbye to them. However, Yuma is not prepared to let him go like this and rushes to the living dead king with a modest request. To begin with, he briefly explains everything that happened with the boy Chimera and asks the lich to save him with his magic of authority. However, he cannot finish speaking until the skeletal magician almost makes him fall to the ground with his stick thus asking whether the words of the immortal boy are true. Before allowing Yuma to confirm or refute the truthfulness of his words, the lich simply assures him that he will face a considerable cost if some of his account of the Chimera boy's situation turns out to be a lie. The two exchange an intense gaze which makes the usually frightened boy notice an astonishing resilience, despite his obvious fear of the dead living deity. When he chooses to resume the conversation, he assures Mr. Lich that he has never lied which is sufficiently persuasive for the bone bag, which prompts them, him and Eva, to drive him to the site of the disturbed Chimera child. However, before we know the consequences, we return to the first city where Yuma was transported into this strange kingdom. At this point, the evil doctor who carried out the experiments on the immortal hero is visited by a mysterious figure who announces to him that their projects are progressing well. The man's incredibly concerned face rejoiced at the news, and he concluded his correspondence with the invisible figure by asking him to wait for his signal before putting everything into practice. At this particular moment, a middle-aged man and his teenage daughter notice the priest and approach him in order to express their deep gratitude to him for how the medicine he recently distributed to the city has cured his condition, as well as that of many other citizens. It turns out that this individual is actually the mayor of the whole city and the priest is therefore naturally pleased to have been beneficial to someone his size. However, all medical treatments in the world are incapable of dealing with a giant, grotesque frog-shaped monster, as evidenced by their total helplessness when one of these creatures suddenly appears and occupies them. Fortunately, the creature loses life in a single stroke due to a succession of spikes that emerge from the ground and hit his body from bottom to top. But the individuals responsible for this timely intervention quickly turn out to be the former heroic comrades of Yuma, Keita, Takuya, and Katomi himself. The brothers and sisters stand out as kind and generous saviors who feel privileged to provide any help to the inhabitants of the city, given that this frog monster was completely weakened. The priest expresses his gratitude to the celebrity trio for another remarkable achievement, while the mayor and his daughter leave the area to protect themselves. As for him, he clearly expresses something in Kai's mind that prevents him from feeling comfortable with accepting his kind words. Fortunately, the priest seems perfectly aware of what is wrong and is pleased to inform them all of an important recent development. They have finally discovered where Yuma is taken. The sweet little Katomi immediately returns a smile, but before they rush, Dr. Strangeface tells them that he is still under the direction of that damn vampire lady who captured him so safe from the castle church. According to him, in addition to her clearly remarkable combat skills, her vampire brainwashing method makes it so risky that they will need reinforcements if they want to save Yuma without compromising their own lives. However, Keita was unwilling to listen to rumors about external support or assistance. He was the one who made desperate and disappointing efforts to save Yuma the last night they saw him, and he is therefore firmly convinced that he will eliminate this evil vampire witch and bring their companion back to health. Keita asks her brothers and sisters to follow her example, and that is all it takes for the group to mobilize in the hope of finally restoring the legitimacy of this trio.